Hello and welcome to Safari Live. And doesn't this big old buffalo bull tell a story? He would have lost his horn due to a little insect, in actually, which is quite interesting, called the horn borer moth. And he's a big old boy. I'm not too sure where he's heading from. Some of you may have uh, recognized him from the Juma waterhole. He came from that direction. So he could well have been there a little bit earlier on today. My name's Scott. I'm teamed up with Tebs on camera. And it's a beautiful summer's afternoon here in the low faults of South Africa. As you can see, though, it's incredibly dry. And that's abnormal in the summer months because it's usually our rainy season. But we are in the middle of a big drought. And it's tough times for the herbivores, just like that big buffalo bull we saw on the move. Now, he's probably a little bit hungrier than he usually would be at this time of year and off in search of some grass to feed on. Dio, wonderful to know that you found these live safaris. I'm told you are having trouble believing that they are in fact live. Well, now you know and I uh, hope you have a wonderful safari with us this afternoon. Let us know where in the world you're watching, dear, and we look forward to getting to know you. Now, for any other new safari goers who may be joining for the first time like Dio, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. It's important that you guys know that if you'd like to ask any questions or send us through your thoughts or observations, it's very easy to do so. You can hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Now, it's quite warm. It's about 32 degrees Celsius, which is about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So a lot of animals are just relaxing in the shady areas, just like these two female Linyala. And again, a combination of the tough times as well as the heat of the African summer is causing a lot of the animals to be on the go slow. This time last year, there was a carpet of green grass over this little open clearing where they're standing. And that gives you an idea of just how much drier it is than normal. So I wasn't out on drive this morning, but Brent and Jamie were. And Brent is out again this afternoon. So two vehicles heading out. And Brent was on the trail of a female leopard. He'll tell you more about it, but he's gone into that general area of where he last had some sign of her. So hopefully he's going to get lucky there. I'm also going to move into that general area and a tiny little dwarf mongoose just ran across the road. And let's see if we can't get you a glimpse of them. They've probably disappeared into, oh no, they've disappeared into a big dead tree stump off to our right there. to Oki in Oklahoma and you are interested to know why nobody has decided to feed on the Cape Buffalo, not the water buffalo, it's Cape Buffalo or African Buffalo that we get here in South Africa and throughout the rest of Africa. They're quite a widespread species, the Cape Buffalo. Water Buffalo you find up in India. And you can certainly eat the buffalo of this area, so it's not that people can't, it's just in this area we let the lion eat the buffalo and we stick to domesticated animals that are designed to be fed on by us. But a, a lot of the wild animals you, you do see out here in Oklahoma, at least almost all of the herbivorous animals will all be consumed in some parts of Africa by various tribes or people that go hunting. So just the fact that you don't see us eating them doesn't mean that they are not eaten by others. Actually, in the Kruger National Park there, I'm not sure if you can do it anymore. It may have changed, but you used to be able to buy buffalo pies so, and other parts of the buffalo. 
if you decided to, but the buffalo pies were quite well renowned. Thankfully, there's a little bit of cloud cover that's just picked up this afternoon out to the west. So there's a kind of thin film of clouds that's diluting the sun, you could say, to a degree. Thanks, Tebs. That will give everyone a good idea of the kind of thin film of protection we're getting. And two other people that I've yet to mention, but critical to this afternoon's safari. Kirsty, who's directing this afternoon's show, and Nikki, who's helping her in the final control room. So there are six of us, I guess, directly involved in this afternoon's safari. But there are many other members of our crew, the tech geniuses, Eugene and Alex. They're probably tinkering away at something, one of the next toys that we are going to add to our arsenal of wonderful gadgets that keep making the show a little bit more cutting edge and good fun, I think. Well, speaking about other crew members, you guys are going to be jumping on with Brent and getting an update on exactly what his plans are. See you later. Welcome to the Sunset Safari, Mike. on safari this evening. Uh, Craig, who I'm sure a lot of you have seen in the Cheetah Plains vehicles as we drive around, has come to on drive with us. So he's sitting behind me. There he is. Afternoon. So if you see a leg or a foot, don't worry, it's just Craig. He's come for a visit. Uh, so uh, quite warm, uh, over 80 Fahrenheit today. So it is a, a bit of a scorcher. And as you can see, this dry weather continues. It looked like a storm building, but it's already dissipated. So hopefully we will get some rain. But as I have been explaining, and I did post that article a few days ago, that how a drought is sometimes not a bad thing. Uh, it creates stronger genetic lines in the herbivores, and your predators actually increase. On average, in the greater Kruger area, when there has been serious droughts, lion populations have increased by 10 to 15%. So very interesting stuff. Of course, it is quite sad sometimes to watch some of the animals as they suffer, uh, but it is nature. And a lot of, I know we've got quite a lot of new viewers, and a lot of you will wonder, why don't we go help the animals? Uh, we're here to observe, we're not here to interfere. So we will let nature take its course. Stuart, well, Stuart, welcome Sharon, uh, who's um, in the US of A and is contacting us to tell us that a lot of the US is having blizzards at the moment. Brent, please stop torturing us with these warm temperatures. Uh, Sharon, I can guarantee you I won't be visiting the US anytime soon then. I'm allergic to the cold. I think my ideal temperature is around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, very pleasant. And you'll see in a few months uh, when the dry, the proper dry season sets in and, and our winter months and it gets cold, uh, I tend to layer up and start looking like the Michelin man. So we are going to head down to the area where I had those last tracks of Karula disappearing uh, this morning. Uh, uh, Karula, she can change direction uh, as many times as a hopefully she will sorry about that uh, sometimes it's get creek beds or drainage lines uh, a gremlin climbs into our Bush. And isn't that edible? Well, I 
unfortunately, it appears like Brent Signal dropped. But for Dio and the other new viewers, that is something that happens, I wouldn't say every day, or very commonly, but it is a reality of being on a live safari. There are these little glitches that happen in real time and we cannot hide from them. So you get to also see the little glitches along the way, but that's what we all really love about the whole experience, is that you're here for the good times and the bad every step of the way with us. And usually the tech stuff just gets progressively better. Well, it is. It's not usually. It is. It's progressively just getting better and better. And like I said a bit earlier, our team of tech wizards are at the forefront of this business. And we're all very fortunate to have them because without them, we've got the cameramen, we've got the, the guides who drive around. But without the brain power and the wizardry that goes into the tech side of things here, yeah, Whatever we do wouldn't be able to reach you guys, so we are all indebted greatly to them. I feel I don't even begin to understand how exactly this works technologically. But I'm told there's a few repeaters, ones in London, one of the main ones, and then from, from here, from the vehicle it goes to one of three repeaters or two repeaters spread out over Juma and Arethusa and from there it gets beamed across somehow to the final control room and it can curse the and from there I think it goes to London. And then it goes to Utah and then it gets to you somehow. Fascinating. Zealand, and you would like to know if sable, a uh, common antelope here, and sadly not in the Sabi Sands, Aaron, we don't get to see them uh, at all often here, although there have been a couple that have been seen at the Encora Waterhole, which is not too far from where we are now, so it's actually just one that's been seen there, I think twice in the last two or three weeks. So they sometimes come into the Sabi Sands, but I've never seen one, and I've been driving around in various parts of the Sabi Sands for close on four and a half years now. So I don't think we're gonna get lucky with that, but that is why I keep saying, spread the word and we'll go to different wilderness destinations and be able to show you different animals. I've jumped out here to show you some small berries. This is called a white berry bush. And it's a very popular fruit at this time of the year. I'm sure we're gonna be able to show you some animals feeding on them. Squirrels, gray go away birds, well, a lot of the birds love feeding on these little berries. But what's interesting is that they're usually, by this stage of the year, about four times, five times the size of this. So it gives you an idea of the problems the animals are facing. Because of the drought, there's not nearly as much food as normal. The marula fruits have done surprisingly well though, and they don't look to be smaller than, than normal, but there may be less of them. Um, or maybe it's just because they come from a much bigger tree that can possibly handle the droughts a little bit better than the smaller trees and bushes. person who's fundamentally important in this whole operation is the person who came up with the whole concept and he's a wonderful man called Graham Wellington and it's his birthday today so happy birthday Graham even though I know for a fact you are not watching um, Graham doesn't watch too many of the live safaris he's actually more of an underwater fanatic he likes diving and on a Saturday afternoon, I don't think he's going to be logged in, especially on his birthday, but we can all be 
be grateful for him and send happy birthday thoughts in his direction. speaking about some of the toys and new gadgets that are coming on board Safari Live, one of which is right here. Now, as Teb zooms in, you'll notice there's a whole bunch of little cameras. There's actually seven of them in that cluster. And what they do is they film 360 degrees, and then there's some very clever software that stitches all of that together and creates a 360 degree video. And you can decide as a viewer where you want to watch. This is a problem, we're going to have to actually reverse quite quickly. I don't know what this, what's happening here. When you encounter animals that you're unsure of in the bush, it's useful to um, just get a little bit of distance between you and them. Look, it's, it's, it looks like a crazy kind of a primate. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's definitely a crazy primate. And there's Craig from Cheetah Plains on the back. He's joining in with Brent. VM on camera there. Always nice to get a view of the guys. And um, Craig from Cheetah Plains is just jumping on board. He's a fellow guide and he's interested in getting to know a little bit more about what exactly we do. Obviously they see us driving around, but it's quite nice to actually jump on board and get to grips with exactly what it is we do. Very, very different to guiding regular guests. That I can assure you. Um, and I love it. I love every bit of it. And it's a pleasant change from having guests on your vehicle every day. And I guess the difference is, is that we do have guests on our vehicle. There's just hundreds, sometimes thousands of you, as opposed to be limited to four or five or six. One of the major things that I love and the major difference and why I prefer to guiding regular guests is because we have got an indefinite future. This could continue until I've got gray hair or no hair and the fact that there's no time limit to us makes for some wonderful opportunities to build relationships, to build on the safari experience, whereas having guests come in for two or three nights and then the new set coming through, it's difficult to get to know people as well as you'd like, and also it's difficult to go very in-depth with safari, with the amounts of safari knowledge you can impart with them, whereas with us we've got a nice mixture of new and old seasoned safari veterans and others who are less seasoned. As I was saying now, this 360 degree camera is a wonderful new toy that we're trying to incorporate into the live safaris. And I know I'm sure a lot of you are interested to know where exactly to watch these 360 degree videos. I'm not too sure exactly. I'm guessing possibly if you search for Safari Live on YouTube and or just check out our Safari Live Facebook page, that would be a good place to start searching for those 360 degree videos. Okay, we're going to send you over to Brent. So as uh, Scott was saying, that you've got to give distance to certain animals. Uh, I'm just going to say, well, the dominant animal pushes into the the less dominant animal has to be away. Uh, so we had a really good good little interaction there. And so we just, at least we know who's boss. Check the treehouse water hole. Zuma at the moment. So it's on that very big seat line that moves all the way down from the top of the crest around the top of Philemon's uh, cut line all the way down and this eventually becomes the running parallel to at the moment so what we're going to do now is go have a closer look at that bit of water that's there and hopefully if the animals haven't messed it up too much uh, you can actually see the water sleeping slowly slowly 
and very interesting and very specific type of soils that this happens on. I know some of you would have heard me talk talk about duplex soils before. And what duplex soil is, is it's, it's sand on top of clay and it varies in depth. But that's also where you get your best grass species on duplex soils. So we'll go have a closer look at that. So even though it looks like it could be muddy, uh, the bottom of that little seep is actually really, really hard. And also, a hot day like this today, it might have attracted some really interesting insects, butterflies, wasps, uh, rubber flies, uh, and bees even. And maybe Karula. Janice in Canada says, don't let Craig off the vehicle, hire that man. Uh, Janice, have you possibly been on safari with Craig before into Cheetah Plains? Maybe, I think. Okay, so we can have a look here. See different spots where the elephants have been digging up at the top end of here. Uh, and at the moment, because it's so dry, those higher uh, excavations are not producing any water, and only the lower ones are. And I think it's a good spot to check. And we've often found leopard sleeping up in this area, uh, and being the only water in the western or southwestern section of the reserve, uh, it's always a good spot to check. has been mudding it a little bit. Let's see if we can find a stick. But often... Yeah, lost this. Oh, you just... Crap. to our southern boundary and just going to double check and make sure that the female leopard that Brent is fairly certain crossed from right to left this morning hasn't come back to us and the core of her territory is to the right, it is on Juma but Kurula does occasionally spend a little bit of time south of us. I'm not actually too sure of the pathway she takes when she does come far south. It's, kind of a, it's been a bit of a recent development of hers. And it is really interesting, and we are very fortunate, to see how much the lives of the leopards will change and how much their territories fluctuate as time goes on. We get great insight into their lives. But I guess you never really get enough. And we get great insights we're only spending out in the bush six hours out of 24 every day and out of the six hours spent out daily very few are actually spent with the various animals so even though we kind of think we know them very well and we know their movements very well we actually don't <laughs> well not as well as we could obviously because there's massive gaps of time between seeing them This little area that she's coming to now is an area where I haven't got to know her kind of moves. So I get, get quite kind of used to using general paths or areas to move through trees to scent mark on. And if you see a leopard moving through a certain area once, it's very useful for a few 
future episodes of trying to track them down and find them. So we're just going to drive very slowly along here until we finally make our way across to Arethusa where we will start to try and search for another leopard, the daughter of the leopard that we're just having a quick look for now and her name is Shadow. Very good places to check for tracks are the road junctions because just like us the animals like to use the roads because they're easier to travel down, less obstructions. They don't always use them but it can be a useful place to check for tracks. Obviously the substrates of the ground on the roads is also one of the best areas to look for tracks as opposed to just in the general bush where it's a lot more tricky to see where animals have walked. Shame, so I'm sure you guys have pieced together the puzzle and that is that Brent's vehicle is not working too well this afternoon so you're going to be with me for a little while. some time since we've seen Shadow, the daughter of Karula, and their territories are their neighbours. So Karula has stayed in her core territory, but her daughter has just squeezed in next to her. And that's fairly common for daughters to squeeze in next to their mothers, whereas sons will move quite a far, far distance off. since joining Safari Live. And Kathy, I guess I've learned to become comfortable with a camera pointed in my face for six hours of the day. Um, that was something that I wasn't used to earlier. And as most of you will understand or agree, it's, it takes a bit of getting used to having these cameras right up in your face if you're not used to that. That's probably one of the biggest things I've got used to. Probably talking non-stop is another. Um, you can rely on bigger moments of silence having guests on your vehicle when they ride here, I guess because for various reasons, the, the sounds and the scenery and the smells can captivate them and you don't have to talk permanently, but with what we do, it's non-stop jabbering. I think a lot of the time. There's an awesome little grass up here and we usually don't pick up the animals, but this is gonna be a little bit different. I don't think we're gonna interfere too greatly in its day. And it's just got the most incredible colorations. Um, oh, look at how awesome that is. It's called, I think, a stone grasshopper. And you can see it's got incredible, incredible camouflage. And it basically looks just like the ground. Now I've forgotten, but I think it's the females that lack wings but the males can fly. So the males and females look very similar, but this one can only jump, which I think it means it's a female for me, but I'm sure you guys will double check. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put it on the ground here and you'll see how well it blends in. Come on, there we go. Look at that, incredible camouflage. And that's a stone grasshopper, I think is the name. With a lot of the insects it can be tricky to be certain who's who because there are so many different types and often in the insect books they may only have a name of one kind but there'll be various kind of similar species to it.
of approaching the area where this female leopard crossed. She crossed further ahead of us and I'm hoping she would have done a loop back towards us and then back into Juba. So this is the area where things are kind of hotting up though in terms of my gut feel. may find some sign of her. Yesterday morning we were incredibly lucky and we had worked out that her daughter's tracks had come on to Juma, Shadow, and established that they were in fact Shadow's tracks, not Karula's, and then we went to go and double check the northern boundary in the hope that we could find some sign of her after she left us to the north. And as we drove along, there she was crossing back into Juma. Teb spotted her. And shortly after that, she caught and killed the baby diker. Well, she didn't actually kill it while we were there. That took some time and actually didn't happen while we were there. I'm not sure if the diker actually just died eventually of the injuries or whether Kirula did, in fact, perform the coup de grace. But an emotional morning was had on Safari Live yesterday, for those of you who were with us. We headed actually back, I'm not sure if Brent and Jamie let you guys know this morning, but we did head into the area of the kill um, yesterday evening, and it was quite late, probably at around 10, 30 or 11, just to see if there was any sign of Karula, which there wasn't. She had already finished off her dike kill and moved off. Hello, beautiful lady Kudu. Look at this. Nostrils flaring as she breathes in and out. And I also love the way her huge satellite dishes are pointing straight at us. I wonder where the rest of her herd is. They usually move in small kind of family herds. I'm sure there'll be one or two more around. There are some impala in the general area as well. Oh, here's another kudu on our right. So that explains it. Here's the rest of the family. There's one or two across here. You may be able to hear a funny kind of a burping roar. If we just keep quiet for a moment, you should hear it. Funny burp. There you go. There's the funny little burp. And let's keep going forward. And we'll try and find the culprit who is making this funny burping noise. I can see there's a lot of mothers with their lambs here, so it could be the mothers communicating with the lambs, or they could even just be a male in and amongst them causing a bit of trouble. I think I found the individual, and it's the one kind of a 10 o'clock there, Tibbs. I think that's the female that's making the noise. Just crossing out to the left of your screen. Oh, and she's just disappeared behind the bushes. Who knows, maybe her lamb has been caught and now she's calling desperately trying to find it. Not an unlikely possibility. signal has temporarily stabilized and he's found you some animals so rush on and enjoy so we sorry about all the gremlins that seem to have invaded and we've just found a little group of dwarf bongos on quarantine uh, there we go that particular little individual we've been watching 
He's got a spider web on his nose. Oh, off he goes under foraging, looking for there is the little bit insects and bugs. There he goes, chop, chop, chop. So I know a lot of our Oh, we're digging there. I'm just go back in there quickly. Started digging. Oh, no, found nothing. Or maybe he did. Doing it. So he might have found something in that little thicket. Fortunately, we're not able to see what it was. So great little excavators. I've got a question for you guys out there. I think some of you will have heard me talk about the social dynamics of dwarf mongoose before. And it is a, a quite an interesting question. So hopefully some of you guys have been paying attention, haven't been lazy. Uh, is what happens uh, when well let me first explain the social structure of dwarf mongoose is very similar to a wild dog you have an alpha pair that do all the the breeding oh, so sweet and uh, if a member of the alpha pair dies and the next sort of beta animals of the same sex have a very similar social rank and how do dwarf mongoose suit out, sort out between those two beta members who becomes the next alpha? And then there's also a little crested Franklin slightly to the left of that mongoose at the base. Oh, there we go. Mongoose and Franklin together. Oh, sorry, I'm not a crested and a tail. There we go, and a tail Franklin. So one for the mammal lovers and one for the bird lovers. So the question was, how do dwarf mongoose, uh, if an elf, a member of the alpha pair dies and the next sort of ranking individual, uh, or they are two of a very similar stature, uh, how do they sort out who becomes the next alpha? And remember to send your answers through to questions at Wild Earth on TV if you're on the email, or if you're a little bit more technologically savvy, pop it on Twitter with a hashtag Safari Live. So this morning, uh, on the Sunrise Safari, I uh, was explaining about how droughts can sometimes be beneficial uh, with hoof action and actually opening up the bush by elephants. And, and we were on our way where I can show you where that's already started to happen on Juma. But we got sidetracked by elephants. So we're going to go up into that area now. Hopefully we will find some more elephants while we're out there. And it has been spectacular, the amount of elephants we've had over the last couple of weeks and that's definitely a, because of the dry conditions uh, they're having to move quite bigger distances between food and water at the moment Mike, who's in sunny Florida, probably the one part of the US that's not experiencing blizzards at the moment. Uh, and Mike is asking, what is the biggest troop of mongoose I've ever seen? Well, Mike, uh, so the original uh, and collective noun from a group of mongoose, just as a little interesting extra tidbit, is a business, a business of mongoose. And Mike, the biggest one I've probably seen well, it's difficult. It's probably banded mongoose in, 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 in Botswana. Um, and there were probably about 50 or 60 in that little, in that, in that business. Actually, I lie. Kusamans in uh, Central Africa. I saw a monster group of Kusamans, uh, probably over 100 of them um, in, in Central Africa. It's more like a corporation. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's a, a corporation of mongoose, as VM says. There we go. Mm, some zebras. <laughs> so 
So Mary in Michigan I said was watching the sunrise safari, and I was talking about the jet, uh, the, the the drought that's happening, and I was saying there's been a large influx of zebra. Mary seems to think that uh, it's because the, the you can see more in in uh, these conditions. It was much greener and much thicker last year. That is also true, Mary, but uh, and there, there are a lot more zebras. Uh, the statistics coming through from the scientists based on the Slavi Sands and Kruger is showing there's probably about a 70% influx of zebras into the eastern Slavi Sands at the moment. And that is the, due to the closing of the water holes in Kruger. So they would traditionally have spent more time there, but there is no water there. So they are focusing on areas that hold water. And I remember when I started in February last year, uh, even if it was thick, we still would have seen the odd striped bottom through the bushes. And we could often go four or five days without seeing a zebra. Uh, now it's difficult not to see zebra three or four times during a single drive. Uh, zebra are bulk grazers. So they're not as picky. Uh, they will eat quite a few different grass species. And uh, although the wildebeest aren't with them at the moment, quite often seen in groups with wildebeest. Uh, wildebeest are very, very picky grazers and they like short grass and the zebra helps aid them find the best grass possible. So there have been many attempts to domestic, domesticate zebra and in this area specifically, there we go. fall. Look at that. Lovely little one there. So, as I was just mentioning, Gail's ask a question uh, that I'll get to after I finish talking about the domestication of zebra. So there's been many attempts and probably only two or three successful ones uh, in terms of domesticating zebra. The main reason for this is this is what was called fly country in the 1800s. So it abounded with tsetse flies that carried seeping sickness that was almost always fatal uh, to domestic horses and cattle, like oxen that were used to draw uh, the transport wagons. And uh, the reason zebra make very, very, or were very, very terrible uh, domestic animals is they don't have a very big load carrying capacity. Uh, so their backs are quite weak, they haven't uh, we must remember we've bred horses uh, to be able to have that very strong back and, and able to, to carry weight. So it would probably take a few thousand years of breeding uh, to actually get a zebra that's really strong enough to be used as a beast of burden. And also their temperaments are not great. They're incredibly violent animals. They bite and they kick. And I know we've seen on, with Scott on the live drives, a zebra stallion seriously beating up a, a young foal. So Gail's question said she spoke to a client of hers who had just come back from a horseback safari uh, in somewhere near the Drakensberg Mountains. And she'd like to know what is the danger of a horseback safari as opposed to a Land Rover based safari. Uh, well, Gail, where your, your client was on safari, uh, there probably was very, very little danger being in the Drakensberg. It's unlikely to have had any members of the Big Five. Um, I personally know the people who pioneered horseback safaris in, in, in Africa and the people who started it will not get on a horse in the bush. And that for me says a lot. Uh, I am uh, very nervous of big cats and, and, and things that they like to eat. And, uh, so, and uh, uh, one of my dad's first general managers in the bush in Botswana, he was uh, one of the wardens of Lhuyamfalozi uh, game reserve and they used to do all their patrols on horseback and he actually had his horse taken out underneath him by a lion and lion obviously is is the worst one i know of uh, incidences where rhino have gored horses that have been ridden by riders if you're brave horseback safari is for you i prefer to be sensible uh, you won't find me on a horse uh, anywhere where there are big five and that's just me personally i know a lot of people will disagree with me uh, but i think you would struggle to find a Safari Live presenter who would get on a horse in Big Five country. And in saying that, uh, I come from a horsey family. My mother is a South African dressage champion. Um, my dad played polo and polo cross and uh, his family had a, a thoroughbred uh, 
stable while he was growing up. So it's all very good riders and all rode for the country. And you won't find either of my parents on a horse uh, where there's big five. But if riding on the rolling hills of the Drakensberg, I think that would be a wonderful experience and I would jump onto it. Except if I was riding in that part of the world, I would probably tie my fly rod to the side of the horse and ride myself to the closest trout and yellowfish stream. Obviously, this very dry weather is something we've been discussing a lot recently, uh, and I know a lot of you are concerned about it. And uh, for those of you who might have missed the sunrise story, I'm just going to do a little update on the drought story I was talking about. So, quite often, the bush works in cycles, and there's numerous different cycles that are running concurrently. Uh, and uh, generally, you've got sort of a seven or eight year cycle, you've got about a 20 year cycle, you've got a 50 year cycle, and some of you even have a 100 year cycle. And those are never always perfectly in those little sort of uh, spots. Uh, it would be very nice for us if they were. It'd make things a lot easier for us to explain. Uh, but over the last sort of 10 years, we have run a very wet cycle. Uh, and what happens, if you have a look, here's a perfect example. Uh, we've got this little group of bushes here. And uh, there's not a tree here that's over 10 years old. And they're all very young, there's a very young uh, sort of Dicrostachus or sickle bush, which uh, if the elephants don't eat it when it gets old. So these have been sort of kept short, the small ones, and they haven't eaten the ones at the back. This can quickly form into an impenetrable wall. And most of our animals out here are grazers. So they like grass, not trees. Uh, and in a very wet period, quite often, what do you got there, Liam? Oh, a little impala behind the bush. Um, Quite often, uh, these certain terminalia, or terminalia species, uh, will, and even the bush willows, will start encroaching on what would be traditionally a grassy area. So, uh, even though you can, it looks like it's wonderful, thick, green, lush bush, there's not a lot of food for the majority of the animals. The majority of the animals would like grass. Uh, so we've gone through this wet cycle, and a lot of these, these small bushes and trees have built up and become quite thick. Uh, and we're in those wet cycles, strangely enough, in an area like this, you'll notice um, your large uh, sort of uh, ungulates, specifically the, the herbivores, um, in an overall thing. And remember, we can't look, it's very easy to look at something very small like Juma and say that's how it should be. We need to look, remember, remember we are part of a sort of 8 million acre, 8 million acre ecosystem uh, in the Greater Kruger National Park. And on an average, if you look at the graphs, animals like wildebeest and zebra uh, and buffalo, I'm not sure about buffalo, I don't check, but I know wildebeest and zebra for sure have been declining uh, during this, uh, this wet period. Now with the dry period, the population is, is going to keep declining. It's probably going to have a very steep drop, and a lot of the weaker animals are going to drop off like flies picked up by the predators. As I said, the predator numbers will generally increase in these times. But then, it's, as I said, the genetics are stronger, the ones that have managed to survive the dry period. And then next, uh, when we get the rain again, uh, a lot of these trees have been removed. And there's been a lot of hoof action by animals moving between uh, long distances between water and food, specifically animals like, like buffalo, the big herds. Uh, and at the moment, you've seen how big these any herds we've been getting. And they have been hitting and digging in the soil, pushing down trees, eating trees. So they're actually opening up these areas again. Uh, and when we get that next rainy season, because it's unlikely that that big rain will come next year again. Uh, it'll be a gradual thing, and, but you will start getting more of these big open areas. So there's one here, which is quite a distinct one that's off to the left here. Um, and this is on a, on a natural seat line coming off the crest of the hill. But even there, you see next to that dead knob fawn, um, there's that sickle bush starting to, to grow again. And that's, I mean, that's probably four or five years old. And I said that can become an impenetrable wall. And once it gets to a certain age, not even the elephants uh, eat it. So here we go. So again, that might not survive this little dry section we're going through. Now I'm going to show you an area which is higher up on the crest. And uh, that is going to be uh, an area that the eddies have really started to sort of to open up. And 
from a game viewing point of view, it's really good. Uh, especially um, if we want to be a little bit selfish uh, from a safari live point of view. Out the rain and, and the bushes are getting thick. I mean, the, the, the bush willows or the cabritums are already starting to turn yellow. And that normally happens in March. Um, so it is very dry. I mean, that could change again with the rain. But our visibility has increased tenfold during a dry period. Also, the area, all the trees are going to be pushed over, it's going to be opened up, uh, and the predators increase, and we can start seeing possibly more kills because uh, there are those weaker animals that don't have as strong genetics as the others, they start falling back. Those are the first to get picked off, and by the end of a really long dry cycle, uh, you, you got, you, you're pretty sure that the, the survivors are fit as a fiddle and going to put the best genetic suit. Um, not the first year, the second year. Uh, the first year, the, the second year after. Uh, and, and then with those really. And sorry about that, it seems like Rusty has got a gremlin in the antenna in this sunset safari. So as I was saying, you get an explosion of, of, of herbivores, so lots of babies, and also babies with the best genetic material to make it through to adulthood. So we're about two minutes away from uh, that area I want to show you where it's been particularly uh, obvious. and. I've had probably 60 elephants in that area and as you can see now it's starting to open up a little bit and we're starting to see a lot of trees pushed down by elephant but the spot up here it seems for some reason they've really focused on the old aerial photos of the Great Kruger from the sort of 50s and 60s um, where the buffalo populations are also quite a bit higher. Uh, the majority of these crests and stuff was far more grassland than it is today. Uh, and even areas that have, were traditionally cattle farms, uh, like where, where my folks live, which is a game reserve now, it was a cattle farm for many, many, many years. And it is now a lot of people who now get into the bush uh, and buy this farm. They're like, oh, isn't this great? Let's take all the cows off. And Make sure bush. Let's leave it. Possibly the worst. Possibly the worst thing you can do for the bush. In fact, uh, a cow is like a buffalo, uh, and you need that constant fertilisation and hoof action to keep the grass species growing. Uh, and quite often, in five or six years, uh, someone can take a very productive farm or game farm uh, and and turn it into an almost dense forest of that sickle bush of Dicrostachys that almost nothing can eat. So it's very interesting, it's a very fine line. Uh, and at the end of the day, as I said, a quote from my father this morning, we often like to be gardeners in Eden. We go take a perfect system that is, operates and knows how to deal with itself, and we start playing with it. Uh, and when that happens, there's always havoc. So here we go. Uh, we actually came down here the other day when we weren't live, and we could not cross the road. The elephants had removed so many trees. So we start looking here, and this is not at the edge of it. You can see he has a nice big, oh, an adult combrisum that's been completely pushed down. It'll still continue to grow, but as we come across right onto the top of the crest, uh, where the soil's a bit sandier, uh, as we head down towards the Impala Plain, the eddies have really done a number in this area. So we're just going to stop here and see how many pushed over trees we can see. Starting from here, and you can see here we've got a little one taken down. They've really started, really going to start working these little groups of round leaf teeth now. And if we come up here, and you can start seeing it open up, and you can see this is all relatively fresh feeding. There's another one there, and they're going to come back through this area a lot more, a lot more times over uh, this dry season. And we also, also, the very important thing is we are starting to see elephants feeding on tree species that if they had a choice, they wouldn't normally feed on. 
and that will also clear out quite a lot of the, uh, the stuff that in a normal rainy season doesn't get fed on. And I mean, even in this very short time, this area is starting to look a lot more open. And it's interesting, this is a huge, a massive uh, sort of bush willow for an elephant to actually push down. They're taking it down completely right next to us. And also, one of the important things that I forgot to mention, I can't believe, one of the most important things about the alleys clearing out the tops of these seep lines and actually creating more grass. Grass likes water, so it actually raises the water table. Uh, and in that, so it creates more water. Obviously, of course, after the dry season, uh, and it gets more water flowing down these seep lines, so then you get uh, better grass and, again, increases the herbivore population. As you can see, look at this opening up really nicely now. So it's fascinating. I think we're going to do a, a little test for the remainder of this this year. And as it, the drought continues, I think this is a really good sort of test zone for us to keep coming back to, uh, keep checking on, uh, and it's going to be very incredible. And if we do get a little bit of rain, possibly early, uh, if we do get even a little bit of early rain next year, um, it is possible, even though it is a dry period, we will get rain. It'll be nice to see if we can come back uh, and count the grass species in an area that the elephants have been really, really focusing on uh, to an area where the elephants have. And also compare the palate, very palatable grass species against the non-palatable grass species. So it'll be a very interesting little test that we can continue through the year. And we'll speak to the other presenters and they can also come and have a look uh, and throw their, their opinion in. to Raisa, Debbie and James and many others, it seems like you guys have been paying attention to me gabbling on. Oh, before we get into there, did you see him there? Yeah? Little black crown chagra, hopefully it doesn't fly. They're very skulky little birds, so quite often challenged to get on the camera. And you'll often just duck down into a thicket like that and actually scuttle along the bottom and disappear out the other side without us even seeing which I think this particular individual has done. So, back to that, uh, so that little mongoose quiz uh, we had, and that was James, I think, Raisa, and Debbie, who were the first to get it right, many others also, and they actually have a groom off. So they literally lick each other and try to be as nice to each other as possible, and the nicest mongoose wins. And they literally get so covered in saliva while they're doing this, it looks like they've sort of been dunked in a bucket. Uh, and isn't that nice where most things out in the African bush try to kill each other to sort out a problem? The dwarf mongoose try to love each other to death. of mongoose. Uh, Joseph is wondering, do mongoose kill cobras? Uh, they can, but they don't always kill cobras. You generally find your, your bigger mongoose species, like your bandits, will be better at that. Um, but the dwarfs will kill little baby cobras and that. And the most famous... Oh, Ellie's! Yay! Uh, the most famous uh, sort of mongoose species uh, that hunts cobras particularly is actually from India. And that is the most common one that actually hunts uh, cobra species regularly. And it was made very famous by one of my favorite authors, uh, Rudyard Kipling, uh, with a little short story about the mongoose called Ricky Tiki Tavi. And that's from India. Oh, it looks like. I wonder if it's the same. heard we had this morning, they were moving this area, but it looks like that little one's found a little bit of a mud wallow and is going to have a mud bath. If I'm going in front, if I'm going. Well, there we go, Andrine, you ask and we deliver here at Safari Live. 
a little monster. See, there's, you can see by the wet area around there that there's been more elephants playing in there. It looks like we're a bit late to the, the afternoon swimming party. If you listen carefully, I can hear quite a lot of Ellie's uh, down to the sort of west of us, but let's check on this little guy while he sprays himself to cool off in this hot African afternoon. <laughs> So now, as much as Ellie's love this, uh, this little bit of water is from the last bit of rain. Uh, it actually affects a lot of the other animals because obviously once an elephant sprays the mud on there, <laughs> look at that. Um, it spreads, oh, nose in the ground. Having a little bit of fun. Could also be um, the tusks teething a little bit and that's why I'm trying to push them onto the, the ground. And let's quickly have a look while that little Ellie disappears. And you can see now that when I drove past this this morning, there was quite a lot of nice... Oh, it looks like another one might be coming to have a swim. Let's just give them a bit of space if they want to come. Sorry, there we go. Um, so if another animal would want to come drink, this morning it was would have been very drinkable water, but now after the Ellie's have been playing in it, you definitely wouldn't want to do that. It's basically a soup. Deciding, oh, should I go to my bath? Should I... Again, sadly, Brent's signal has dipped, which is a pity because it sounds like you're enjoying a great elephant sighting with him. But hopefully you'll be able to wiggle the vehicle around into a slightly different spot and you should hopefully be able to rejoin him in not too long. Tibbs and I are on Arethusa searching for any sign of shadow. So far, got very excited. One of her usual kind of areas that we do actually get to see her around a little pan called Red Dam. We heard a squirrel alarm calling. And I was hoping the squirrel was going to lead us to her, but no joy and couldn't find out exactly what it was that the squirrel had seen. I'm guessing it was probably a snake or a bird of prey. I checked the area quite thoroughly and if there had been a leopard there, I'm fairly certain we would have seen it. But as so often when responding to alarm calls, it can be for animals that are masters of disappearing, like snakes or birds of prey. It's always very exciting, but often you get let down and not find anything at the end of an alarm call. here on the on the left I mean we are so close to Arethusa they're our neighbors and all of the little puddles like this on Arethusa have still got a little bit of water in them whereas on Juma there isn't any and that indicates how even over such a small distance the amounts of rainfall can vary drastically and at least Arethusa got some decent rain about a week or so ago, I think was when we had our last little downpour. But fascinating. I remember Brent came back one morning saying, all of the Arethusa little puddles and water holes are filled up with water, and I couldn't believe it because we were just so close by, yet the rainfall experienced on the two different properties was, as I've said, drastically different.
Tibbs, just through that gap, sadly, um, on that dead branch up there, Tibbs. Higher up, I think, at the top of that, or was it somewhere there? No, sorry, wrong tree. Um, on that little white stick. Oh, there's another one. Very pretty birds. Anyway, they tend to not really hang around the European bee eaters, but at least you got a glimpse of that one. Joseph, in YouTube, you would like to know what is my favorite tree in Africa, and it is the baobab tree. Sadly, we don't get any here, Joseph, but slightly further north of us, probably only about 50 or 60 miles north of us, the belt of baobabs begins and continues all the way up to through Mozambique, Tanzania, Kenya, and north thereof. And there are beautiful big trees. You only get one species of the baobab in Africa, and I think another five or six in Madagascar. Madagascar is the home of the baobab. And I think there's even an Australian baobab. So I think there's seven different types across the globe. Australia has one, we have one, and Madagascar has the other five or six, I think. Massive trees that look like they were designed specifically for a fairy tale. There's one in South Africa that's big enough to even have a small bar in it. I mean, they have massive circumferences, and one has a big kind of cave inside it that's been turned into a little bar. I think Brent's been there. Uh, those are my favorite. In this area, though, my favorite tree would probably be the marula tree. It's the leopard we see. It's the leopard. It's the tree we see leopards sleeping in most often and it also bears the delicious marula fruits, which we can enjoy fresh off the ground as they drop here. And this is the season for them. Or we can enjoy a delicious liqueur called amarula, which is made out of them. Or, last but not least, a local brew. Basically a beer that's made out of the fermenting fruits in big barrels. unlucky individual that has been broken down and I'm just going to go for a closer inspection. I think it could well have been broken down by elephants and the reason, the big reason why it would have been easier for an elephant to snap this tree down is because you see me, I can grip inside straight out of this crack. You can see all the sand falling down, they're termites would have carried up into this tree, so the termites have had a bit of an effect on it, but I think an elephant did push it over. Um, and the reason for that is that if we look over here, the kind of the terminal branches of some of the trees, you can see where the leaves have been broken off or branches have been broken off, as has one up here. So I think an elephant could well have been feeding on this. You can see the break up there. And even though they do break down trees quite often, it's a necessity, a necessary destruction. Because if there weren't elephants breaking down a lot of the trees here, we'd be in a very thick jungle where a lot of the other animals would not be able to exist. It sounds like Brent's resorting to taking the vehicle back in 
to get Eugene to have a look at it. So you guys are going to be stuck with me for the foreseeable future. And let's hope that they manage to work out what the problem could be. It's fascinating. I mean, that vehicle is out this morning working perfectly as far as I'm aware. Uh, nothing's changed during the course of the day yet. It simply doesn't want to work this afternoon. So not an easy job troubleshooting and working out what has caused the problems out here. Because often there's no evident reason or cause for the machines to pack in. But they've got a little mind of their own, I guess. kindly relayed the whereabouts of that herd of elephants that you were watching with him to me so we might head across into that general area but nice to know that he's already not worrying about only getting his vehicle ready but still worrying about you guys seeing as much as possible in Amsterdam, you interested to know exactly how well the scent organs of the predators work out here, and also that coupled with the smell of the different prey that they may feed on. And you'd like to know whether or not I think that predators would be able to smell the difference between the different antelope. And yes, Petra, I am 100% certain that the predators of this area will know the difference between the smell of a diker and a steenbuck and a diker and a pala and a buffalo and a zebra. All of the animals will have their own scents and all of the predators will know what scent the, the, those animals belong to. So if we were to blindfold Karula and lay out a whole different array of wild game for her, I think she would get 100% for being able to tell who's who. And the reason for that is that, you know, their senses are so much better than ours, it's almost hard to comprehend, Petra. But if you think about it logically, an animal like a leopard will not only rely on its sight to be able to track down prey, it will rely hugely on smell and will often smell its prey before it actually sees it. And obviously it'll then learn which animal has which smell. So there's no doubt about it in my mind. Austin, who's just 13 years old, and you're interested to know if the big cats of this area are ever aggressive towards us, and usually they're not. I mean, they've grown up seeing the vehicles, seeing us, hearing us, smelling us, never being fed by us, never being harmed by us, and therefore they tend to not give us too much of a hard time at all. Occasionally they may snarl at the vehicle if we're getting a little bit too close to them or simply if they're just in a bad mood, having a bad day. So 
The most I've ever had to deal with is a few snarls in the vehicle. When walking and foot tracking down animals, I've had slightly more serious charges, but even then, it's not very common. And as soon as you listen to their initial growl or snarl and move back, then they will respect that and you can move on without any trouble. So the big thing is being able to read into their body language and if you listen to them, they're not going to have to jump on you to teach you a lesson. I guess it's kind of similar to humans. With humans, you'll, you'll seldom get into a fight with somebody without having an argument first, and usually the argument will settle it. And the animals like to operate the same way. Let's see what these cat buffalo are up to. We may get to see one of them wallowing in this mud wallow. You can see, judging by their coats, that they've already been in the mud. And let's just check if this other individual on the right doesn't start going for it. He's not in the best spot you can see. He's trying to rub his horns in the mud there. <coughs> I've often been jealous of the animals that can wallow in these muddy pans in the hotter months of the year. The main animals that do wallow in the mud are the rhino, the warthog, the buffalo, and the elephant. Now, Debbie in Vancouver is interested to know how animals like the Cape Buffalo here who will feed on grass when the going is a good, but will occasionally feed on leaves in, in times like this during a drought. And Debbie's interested to know how will that affect their digestive system and So um, we're back at camp, unfortunately. Uh, we can't figure out why the gremlins have invaded Rusty. Eugene is actually directly behind VM. We've got the back open. He's got his fancy machines and he's fiddling and looking at satellites, but we think it could be a heat issue. Hopefully we'll be able to get it up and running uh, ASAP. Uh, in the meantime, let me just move so I can hear if we've got any questions we can take while we're standing by here. So unfortunately, it seems like the gremlins found Scott, and uh, I wasn't quite prepared to see you guys again while we're fiddling with the vehicle, but nice to be back, uh, even though we can give you a quick tour uh, of what we can if you have a look down there. Um, that's the entrance through to the DRC where everyone, everyone stays, and that window that's taped closed, oh, that one there, that is the cam ops room where all the kit is stored, uh, and, and stuff is done. Nobody else is allowed there. No one else is allowed there apart from the camera operators, but we don't listen to them anyway. And then this side you've probably seen a few times. Uh, it's upgraded slightly over, over the last while. We've got some shelves now for all our tools and kit for when we have to fix the, the vehicles. Uh, a compressor, VM is very happy about that. We had a tiny little compressor, uh, and VM, I think, VM, VM must have written, I don't know how many, we need a big compressor, we need a big compressor. We have a big compressor now, and we use it for two things. Normally, for pumping tires, uh, but also it's an incredible tool to clean the kit. Obviously, being out in the bush, we get lots of dust and stuff like that. So using compressed air rather than 
using a, a cloth and which can often scratch lenses and things like that. So using compressed air is a very handy thing. So it looks like Scotty has uh, evaded his gremlins, uh, but uh, if he finds any more, I'll be here and we'll try to give you uh, not much more of a tour we can do, uh, but we'll try to keep you entertained anyway. So let's jump back with Scotty. Well, the gremlins are out to play this afternoon, causing us various issues. Let's hope Brent isn't stuck at the DRC for the rest of the afternoon. But at least some of you got a little insight into where these vehicles sleep every night. And I'm told you also got a glimpse into the mysterious lair that is the cam ops department. Cam ops room is where all the toys are kept, or at least a lot of the toys. to Roy, he's interested a little bit more about how our rotations work out here. And at the moment, we technically are supposed to have three presenters on the ground at any time, and we do two drives on, one drive off. And James is not here at the moment, he is on leave. So there's four of us for the time being, three of which are at work at any given stage with one on leave. And I'm not too sure when he comes back, but because we don't always have a perfect six week on, two week on rotation, which is the plan, we often all have to be here for the Nat Geo productions, and that throws things off kilter. So we are flexible, but technically we work six weeks on, two weeks off, and there should be three presenters on the ground at any given time with two working. The same goes for the cameraman and the same should technically go for the directors. But they've been a little bit unfortunate at this stage and haven't had much relief. So Nikki and Kirsty have been day in and day out. But the rest of us have been doing okay. Just like the other buffalo at the other little water hole, these guys are enjoying the cool, refreshing mud. It's quite interesting, the one standing up furthest away from us is quite easy to distinguish between the other buffalo and actually recognize him from across a Juma when he spent time there. He's got a very big boss that hangs quite low over his eyes, which makes him look quite silly, the one that's standing up there, Tebs. So he's got almost like this strange helmet on that makes him look a little bit awkward i feel not the best looking buff on the on the dirt roads of arathusa and juma and i guess we could compare his boss and how close it gets to his eyes that's a good view compared to the other one that's standing up who's more of a typical looking buffalo a better example of the two good well, Buffalo, I don't think there's any line nearby, so you guys have got nothing to worry about. That's the good news for you. Dean, and if you would like to know what is the most dangerous thing that's ever happened to me whilst out on safari, and the 
story that comes to mind today is an encounter with an elephant bull. And the buffalo right here, we can probably enjoy some close-up views of. And it was with an elephant bull I was taking two travel agents from Bangkok on a walk along the Sand River, which flows through the Sabi Sands, when the same elephant bull that four days earlier had knocked over our head ranger and attempted to squash him. Thankfully, the head ranger got knocked into a kind of rocky crevice that he was scrambling through trying to escape the elephants. And the elephant couldn't reach him in this kind of natural coffin that he fell into. A coffin that saved his life, not that he got carried away in. And four days later, that very same elephant uh, bumped into, or we bumped into him on a walk, and he did his best to try and squash us as well. But thankfully, after half an hour of shouting and screaming and backwards and forwards, um, the vehicle came in and chased the elephant off. Well, it actually turned out that the elephant chased the vehicle um, that was coming to chase the elephants. And no one was hurt. Um, that was the closest I've ever come to shooting an animal. And it was a big elephant bull that had crossed that human-animal boundary just four days earlier. So that obviously made a huge impact on the scenario. And once the wild animals understand that they can quite easily overpower us, it can be a downward slope for them thereafter. And I think that same elephant was eventually shot at a lodge nearby. It was just causing too much trouble. <clears throat> Funnily enough, the two, the two kids from Bangkok had no idea of the gravity of the situation. So that actually aided in the whole thing because they thought it was just all part of the experience and all part of the show, um, which kept them calmer than they should have naturally been. Now, just to make you guys realize how dangerous I am, and how well I can use what is called a panga to protect myself even against the most dangerous of animals, I'm going to do some gardening for you. And this tree, sadly, has picked the wrong road to grow over, and we are now going to do some pruning. This is a bush willow, so it's an incredibly hard wood. And you can tell by the aggression that I've had to hit it with that it is quite tough. And it sadly was in the wrong spot there. Makes for great barbecuing, that tree. Coals burn incredibly slowly. Sorry, tree. This is not a very well-traveled road, and it's quite bumpy, very thick around us. So most of the guards tend to not drive it, and that's exactly why I've decided to drive it again this afternoon. It's been quite some time since driven this road. It's called Parallel Road North. And hopefully this is where we are going to find Shadow, a female leopard. I love driving these roads that you know haven't been driven because there literally could be a leopard with a rhino up in a tree that it's killed and nobody has seen or found. Jim, you'd like to know if we have any cheetah here and are they endangered? The answer is yes to both. We do have cheetah here. However, sadly, very few and we see them intermittently. I think since November 2014 when I arrived, we've probably only had four or five cheetah sightings on Safari Live. And a number of reasons for that, one of them being that they are endangered, so their numbers are not as good as they could be, or as good as they should be. 
but in various different reserves or different parts of the Kruger National Park, for example, cheetah numbers will be high because the habitat is more suited to them as well as the predator, dens predator density more suited to them. Now, being the fastest mammal on the planet, they like open spaces, which they can use that speed in. Looking around, you don't see much open space, and across most of the Sabi sands, there are not many open areas. So, the wrong habitat, coupled with the fact that there are very high amounts of lion and leopard, as well as hyena, which make cheetahs' lives a misery. All three of the latter will kill cheetah at the opportunity, and cheetah are weak and frail, built for speed, not for confrontation. So, not a good spot to be a cheetah. But we may get lucky, Jen, and we'll get a glimpse of one at some stage, I'm sure, in the next few months. But if we want to see cheetah and more different animals, again, You've got to let more people know about Safari Live and then we'll take you to more places. It is a very simple equation that we can all help to contribute towards. Because there are some areas in Africa where you can go and view cheetah very easily. And they're one of the best big cats to actually watch hunt because they hunt in open areas. Unlike lion and leopard which like to hunt in thick bush. So a lot of you are asking me about the animals that are less seen here. Another one has come through from Shelley, interested to know about monkeys. And yes, we do see monkeys here. The monkey that we specifically see is called the vervet monkey or green monkey. And again, we don't see them as much as we would like to. We also don't see baboons here very often. And it was just during February 2015 that a troop of baboons came through Juma and we've got a few sightings of them, but other than that, not many baboons, which is awfully strange, and I don't know why that is the case. And there's another very small primate that we see called the bush baby, lesser bush baby, which is a nocturnal primate that hops around the trees at night. It's absolutely tiny. And that and the vervet monkey are gonna be the two primates that you see with us in all likelihood on safari, unless a stray baboon comes strolling through. some great news and that is that the most evolved of the primates on this planet have managed to fix Brent's vehicle and he is ready to receive you. So uh, hopefully we're back. So between Viam and Eugene, uh, we think it's an overheating issue because it doesn't happen when we're driving. It only happens when we're stopped. So we've got a tiny little fan from the camera operator's room that we showed you that they use to cool themselves while they're working on the computer. And we've managed to punga a, punga a plan, and that's very Swahili for like make a plan. Uh, in Viam's case, a bur maka plan. Uh, which is a very famous South African saying about a, a farmer makes a plan and uh, Vim has made a plan with Eugene. But now, I mentioned, as a lot of you know, I had a, uh, Vim and I had a really quite scary experience. We had an, a female Nyala dive through Vim's passenger window and jump onto my lap. And uh, I thought I'd gotten most of the glass out, but now over the last three days, random bits of glass keep expelling themselves from my body. So there is the next one. So obviously the human body is incredible. And if we look at things like lions and stuff like that, and we often think those wounds are completely terrible and stuff like that, and they recover. So here's an example on our body, which is a lot less tough than a lion's body. If we have a look there, I haven't removed it because I wanted to show you guys. Can I really look at the monitor? No, it's too close. Uh, let me go too close. Yeah. Let's move back a little bit. Um, well, I know that I know we can zoom onto the dashboard. So how's that? Oh, cables in the way. There you go. So there we can see. There's just a tiny little piece of glass. If I squeeze it, it should come out. Mm. Oh, it's not coming out. Probably need a pair of tweezers. So I don't want to make you guys get sick out there. So I'm not going <laughs> to squeeze it and manhandle it in front of you guys. But it's amazing. So. 
the, the human body, so what's happening is my white blood cells are actually um, have formed around it and, and a lot of people get really grossed out by pus. Now pus is probably one of the most important things in a human body and in an animal's body. So if any foreign object is lodged in there, those white blood cells build around it and actually push it out and that's what's happening. This one is actually quite a nice minor one. I had one out of the back of my leg which was about this long and literally the size of a pin. So that was actually quite painful. This one, uh, not a lot of nerve endings on a knee. Um, you have to hit it quite hard, so that's not too painful at all. So don't worry. But I'm not going <laughs> to manhandle it now. I'll try to find a, a pair of tweezers in our first aid kit, and I'll take it out delicately. And those of you who've been watching for a while know I'm lying. As soon as I'm off air, I'm going to rip it out. But let's carry on. I'm going to head back towards where those elephants were, see if we can find them again. Hopefully, they're still around. Um, but I think they might have moved off. So what I am going to do is we've been going up towards the sort of west, the northwestern corner of Juma quite a bit recently. Uh, and there's those amazing elephant highways that crisscross. This time of the day, I'm hoping we bump into some of them moving from their feeding areas to the water. So Cecilia says we often speak about endangered animals, but it's not often we speak of endangered plants. Uh, so the Sabi Sands is quite a, it's part of a biome that is quite well widespread and, 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 and not under too much threat. So there's very few endangered plants in this biome. Uh, there are a few, some small flowers and stuff like that, but they're probably, uh, from an evolutionary point of view, going to become extinct anywhere. But there is a tree species that used to abound in the Sabi Sands. And we touched on this briefly, I think, a few safaris ago, uh, that is not there anymore. So there is only one on Juma. I know about four on another property called Ottawa, and about another five down in the south uh, around Sabi Sabi. Uh, there's only one I know about in Juma. And there's a very interesting story about why this particular tree species, and it's one of my favorites. It's not endangered, it is actually sort of becoming endangered, but normally it's, it's very common in what we call Brachystegia or Miombo woodland, which occurs up north in Africa. Um, and uh, it is a tree that a lot of you will remember quite fondly because when I tried to climb it, I nearly fell out. So there we go. Uh, it's that tree at the back there that VM's going to zoom into now. Very pretty pods. Um, I'll go see if we can find one now. Uh, its Latin name is Pterocarpus angolens, uh, and also known as a mukwa sometimes or a kiat. Uh, it is a species of teak or bloodwood, an incredibly beautiful red hardwood. And we spoke about. Uh, the history of the Sabi Sands a few drives away. So there's a marula branch in front. Let's go a little bit closer so we can have a look at those leaves. And we sp were speaking about the history of the Sabi Sands and I described uh, the Salati railway line, uh, which was done by that Italian count as a bit of a, a scam to get money out of the then British administration. Ah! So I'm going to go see if I can find some of those seeds to show you. But I did mention to Scott where I thought the Ellies would be. He's made his way there. So he's with the elephants. And uh, they're a little bit more interesting than my tree. So we've just stumbled upon what we think could be the same herd of elephants that you were watching with Brent earlier. We've come into this general area. And I'm just now trying to work out how to get you some better views of them. It's quite thick. I've only seen two so far of the female and this youngster that you've just been looking at. Interestingly enough, Shadow did walk down this road, but in all likelihood yesterday. The tracks were heading in the opposite direction to where we're moving now. And they sadly aren't fresh. And I can tell that they're not fresh because they're not very crisp and defined. So not really worth following up on, but at least useful to know that she did come here yesterday. We did have her tracks in this general area yesterday morning before finding her mother, Karula. I'm not 
not too sure what to think, whether these are the same elephants that Brent had or whether these are different ones. I'm just going to creep a little bit further forward. Oh, I can wait for that youngster to come through. There's the mother. No idea where the rest of the herd could be. It's abnormal for just a mother and a calf to be roaming about, so I'm sure there are some others around. But in this very thick bush, it's not easy to know where they are. Oh, I've just spotted one straight ahead of us, so... Maybe these are the stragglers at the back of the herd. This is a great angle to be able to tell that she is a female, even though all we can see is her head. And you'll notice she's got a very 90 degree angle, very prominent right angle on her forehead when she was turning broadside to us. Now that she's facing us, it's not as easy. But the bulls will have a much rounded or more rounded forehead than the females. And you can see it again quite well now. Lincoln might be worth creeping forward to see what the rest of the herd are up to. They might be in slightly more open areas. Well, that, here comes this youngster, so we'll wait a little bit. So the elephants that you were with, well, I'm told, were playing in the mud. And as you can see, these ones do have some moisture and mud on them, so that's a good clue to indicate that it could be the same ones. What's interesting, though, is that these ones appear to be heading towards Juma, not away from Juma, and you were viewing the elephants on Juma coming towards Arethusa. So that's the one thing that isn't making sense at the moment. But it's possible that they've come onto Arethusa and have now changed direction and are heading back towards Juma. So there's one little link in the chain that isn't making too much sense now, but we are in that area. That general area where Brent suggested we should head to, so well done Brent for those directions. You can see how the youngster was just using its foot there, I mean not clearly because the bush is very thick, but you saw how that foot was kicking forward and they will often break off small plants by gripping on with their trunk at the top of the plant, wrapping it around the plant and then kicking the base of the plant with their foot. Marilyn in California would like to know if we have any other types of elephants here on Juma, and the elephant in specific she would like to know about is the elephant shrew, the small rodent. And sadly, we don't have any elephant shrews here in the Sabi Sands. Otherwise, we would have done our best to try and film them for you. They are incredibly cute. But they are the only member of the small five that we do not have here. We have the leopard tortoise, we have the rhino beetle, we have the ant lion, and we have the buffalo weaver. All we lack is the elephant shrew. Good, let's see what the rest of the herd are up to they aren't in a better spot for us to view them. I saw one that was right here somewhere. It's probably just moved on a little bit. Howdy, 
she's just jumped on board and she's just remarked that it's a marvelous way to start the safari with some elephants and very happy you've joined at a convenient time for both you and the animals that we are viewing. On elephants. Where have you gone? It's remarkable how such big beasts can disappear so quickly. Convince these are different elephants to the ones that you were seeing with Prince. So I want to turn around and go and have a look for those ones. This is also not the best area for trying to get good views of Ellie's. And interestingly, this is a strange part of our prophecy, but Arethusa starts at this road junction here and continues south and west whereas everything north of here and west we cannot go to it's a thin strip of property called Sibambili so that's another reason why I don't think it's going to be worth hanging around with those ellies because they are on a property where we cannot drive I don't want to be breaking the law Saturday afternoon, so we will head off in search of some other elephants. It shouldn't be too far away. This is right where Brent said so, so maybe they have just turned around. Okay, well you guys are in for a treat. Brent has somehow got himself into a tree, and I would urge that you try and stay with him for dismount as he tries to climb down from that tree because that's when it's going to get interesting. Enjoy. So welcome back. What that little gap did was enable me to climb the tree without embarrassing myself profusely. Like the last time I climbed this tree, uh, one will remember I was wearing long pants and I couldn't quite bend my knees and I nearly became the first safari live presenter ever to fall out of a tree live on game drive. Fortunately, this time, short pants, much easier. So as I was saying, really interesting tree in the history um, of the Sabi Sands. They used to be far more prolific. And I say, I probably only know about 10 trees in the whole Sabi Sands. There might be a few in North uh, where I haven't been before. Uh, and there might be a few in the West where I haven't been before. So it is a, got lots of different names, but it's a teak family. And we talked about that failed railway line down in the southern Sabi Sands, how a lot of the original landowners used to get here. And then their staff would meet them with an ox wagon and take them through to the camps on the Sand River. So, the reason there are very few of these trees, as I said, is a really beautiful red hardwood. And hardwoods are used for railway sleepers. So the majority of the trees in the Sabi Sands, the Terracarpus trees, were cut down and were made as railway sleepers. Uh, very, very beautiful wood, very, very hard wood, very slow growing wood. And obviously a lot of those, those seeds were removed and they haven't really made a comeback yet. So very interesting uh, how humans are, are one of the other animals apart from elephants can actually completely change their ecosystem. We take it to a whole next, next level. And there we go. Definitely one of my favorite trees in Africa. Uh, I've seen massive ones up in Zambia and Tanzania. Uh, even northern Botswana and northern, uh, northern Zimbabwe. But beautiful, beautiful trees. So now the fun part comes. I'm going to come down to show you the pod. Okay, head first like a leopard. Head first like a leopard, Vim says. Uh, Vim, <laughs> I might just leap like a leopard from here on top of you. So fortunately, this is where being a little bit taller than James aids in tree climbing. It's not the going up, it's the descending. So instead of having to really scuttle about, and I know you guys have nearly seen James come out, I can just sort of sedately lower my long frame down onto the bonnet. Like that. Not so sedate, but anyway. So we did manage to find a seed. And uh, here's one of my favorite seeds. And actually at home, has a nice big display. This one's obviously a bit old and been a bit insect ridden. I've got all sorts of different seeds um, from all over Africa that I've managed to collect. Uh, but the most of them that sit in the bowl and sort of the dining room table are these teak seeds. It's a nice furry center, big wings uh, designed to catch the wind and often make a very nice display piece mixed in with some large fruited bush willow. 
seeds. There we go. Vim, do you want to keep this one for your for your desk at home? I'm probably just going to throw it away. Oh, Vim. <laughs> there we go. So let's continue on. Uh, see what else we can find. I nearly forgot. Um, so obviously, I didn't wait for the, <laughs> the tweezers, and I managed to get that piece of glass out of my knee. There we go. Oh, it nearly disappeared. So there we go. That's a little one. As I said, there have been some bigger pieces coming out, and there are probably a few more still to come out of my body. There we go. And as I was saying, it's incredible how... Uh, the white blood cells in mammals work and we often forget that we're also an animal and so the same thing will happen with a lot of the animals we see out here so astralina says i should get craig to make a poultice out of leaves to apply to my knee so it recovers well uh, well actually not at all no, here we go craig says you should just cut it off well <laughs> I'm quite attached to it, Craig. Uh, I think I might put you in the next thorn bush. Where's a nice buffalo thorn? Oh, there's a nice buffalo thorn. Oh no, he's a guest. We have to be nice to guests. I'm going to carry on. Thank you keep, for that. keep forgetting that. So kind. So um, we will actually. I'll try to see if I can have a look. Um, actually, there's one of the trees you can make a poultice out of. Uh, that helps with wounds. Very high in tannins and silver cluster leaf. Also, you will remember, you've seen us chew these leaves many times. They also have a, a, a slight, uh, oh, I can't even remember now. <laughs> I've gone completely blank. Um, anesthetic effect. So if you chew those leaves, they'll actually dry out the saliva in your mouth and also numb your gums. So uh, traditionally used quite often for toothache uh, in, in combination with some other species. But also you'll notice baby elephants quite often when they're teething around a year old will also eat uh, a lot of that terminalia to try sort of numb their gums as, that, as their teeth are coming through. But the best best of all the sort of leaves to use as a bandage is an arum lily and the dry weather has knocked the arums out before they've even produced a flower this year uh, but I'll keep a lookout maybe we'll find one uh, on one of the seed lines but while we continue on to see what we can find uh, Scott has got one of the strangest looking antelope we get here at Juma. Well, it's been quite some time, at least since I've seen the wildebeest and the youngsters. I'm not sure exactly what herd this is. It's quite a big one. Oh, that youngster had a bit of a spring in its step. And Tibbs, maybe if we actually go to those three that are all lined up there together now, and we can see that boards of at least the smaller one in the middle like a dried out piece of jerky or what we in south africa call biltong a delicacy dried meat is a very popular dish out here or snack rather not really a dish and they're the adults the brindled gnu or blue wildebeest the one on the right is actually uh, an adolescent you could say it's got a brown head even though its horns are quite big the one in front now you'll see has a blackhead, so that indicates that it's older. And that other one could have been born this time last year, so it could be a yearling. And they are doing their best to gobble up what little green grassy shoots are here. A tough time for the herbivores, as we've already discussed, but these wildebeest are still looking in good shape. Oh, Tebs, here come the rest of the youngsters catching up to their parents.
Debbie, apologies, and halfway through answering your question earlier, we lost signal, and you were interested to know how will leaves affect the digestive systems of grazers who typically eat grass? And I don't think it will affect the digestive system too negatively. It possibly won't taste as good for them, because it's an abnormal kind of dish, you could say. And you might find that their digestive system isn't as effective at, at digesting leaves as it is grass. But I'm not too sure. I don't know the finer details of how the digestive systems will be affected by various plant matter. I feel like Professor Leo Smith may be quite useful with regards to this topic, so it'll be interesting to hear his thoughts. But I don't think they're ever going to completely, you know, like an animal like a buffalo or like these wildebeest is never going to resort to eating leaves as an entire tr entirety. It's just going to supplement its diet with leaves. And if there's absolutely no grass around and only leaves, you'll probably find that they will not be able to make it through. But then again, I've never been in a drought situation like this before, so there's going to be a lot learnt in the coming weeks and months with regards to how resilient these animals are and also how their bodies can handle the change. Well, wonderful. Thank you, all the beasts. Good to see you again. And good to see that there are quite a few young calves still alive there. It's probably got to do with the fact that we haven't had huge amounts of lion in this area over the last couple of weeks. But when there were lion here last and these little wildebeest were much younger, they killed three or four in one night. And gives an idea of just how vulnerable the animals are when they are in their first few weeks. But now they threw that, so hopefully and each day that they grow bigger, they chances of making it through to adulthood become greater. Okay, well, Brent's found some other funny grey animals that you're about to go and see. So we just had a very brief visual of one of the cutest little animals out here. I'm going to see if we can get another a view of them as they were disappearing. You got any sight from up there, Craig? No one? Uh, there you go. You got them? Must stop forward no, back? One o'clock, they're gone. Gone. Uh, unfortunately, there were some tiny little baby warthogs. Um, actually, I'm going to go around and maybe we can catch them as they cross uh, an open patch from the other side. So it pays to be cautious when you're a little warthog. Uh, one of the favorite snacks uh, of our resident leopard population is a baby warthog. And I know those who are watching during Big Cat Week uh, will remember Tingana, the dominant male leopard, actually going, taking his whole body, tail and all, down a warthog hole and pulling out a newborn baby. So it pays for them to be a little bit cautious. I'm hoping if we zoom around, we might catch them on the power line at a bit of a distance that they feel a bit more comfortable and they don't run away. And no such luck. Worth a try. Um, you might have just heard in the distance what sounded like a dog barking, uh, and that is probably Mike and Candice, the general manager and whatnot of uh, Juma's dog, and often when they bark it means there's a leopard close by, so we're going to go have a look. And there's an old buffalo bull. We'll see you later, sir. We're on a, on a hunt for felines. Could also be hyena, but generally I know those dogs quite well. When I hear that, there's possibly a predator nearby. Uh, 
Little Anne in Connecticut. I uh, hope it's not too cold in Connecticut. I think one of the coldest I've ever been in my life was when I was visiting Connecticut. Uh, not sure how you guys survive those winters. Uh, but uh, Julianne would like to know, if leopards run from hyenas and lions, where do they stand in the sort of predator hierarchy? Uh, well, Julianne, lions uh, in the predator hierarchy are number one, and there's nothing really close to them. Uh, well, a male lion. Uh, hyenas will often harass a group of lionesses, but as soon as a male lion arrives, they tend to move off. Now, one-on-one, -on -one, a big male leopard and a single hyena. It all, a lot depends on the individual character of that, that leopard. Sometimes the leopard will fight the hyena and win or chase it off. But add a, another hyena to the, to the equation and the leopard will move off. Su superiority in numbers is one of the hyena's best ploys. But now, strangely enough, the leopards will also run from wild dogs. And again, that's uh, mostly su superiority in numbers. And I've actually seen a female leopard killed by wild dogs in Botswana. So we're at the Gallagher waterhole. Sorry, Mr. Buffalo. And there's a couple of old boys here, but Mike and Candace's house is just over there. Um, what I'm doing is I'm going to ask Final Control to just let Jamie know in case it is a snake, not a predator, so she can go have a look. So there is quite an active thoroughfare down the little river system that runs in front of Gallagher Camp and also in front of Mike and Candace's house. And we often have leopard using this little system and often stopping for a drink. So it doesn't look like there's anything here right now. And now that I'm a bit closer, the dog bark sounds like it could possibly maybe be more of a, a snake um, or, or something like that rather than rather than a leopard or a hyena. Anyway, Jamie will go investigate and once she gives me an update, I'll let you know what it was, if it was anything. So Scott was talking about the, the digestive systems uh, of animals briefly and he said I might have a little little bit to weigh in on on that particular topic uh, specifically because we're noticing some of the animals that are grazers so predominantly feed off grass are starting to feed on on trees because there's so little grass and will it affect their digestive it will some of the grazers aren't there we go them spotted a hyena well spotted vmp okay, we'll see it. Scotty has planned to visit the hyena den later on drive. I think this hyena is coming from the current den site. Uh, it's just down here somewhere. Let's see if we can get a spot of it now. Just briefly saw it between the trees. So obviously this area is incredibly active with hyenas. And quite a few of their den sites are in this area. There you go, Vimpy. On us. Yes, as Vim says, he pulled the Karula on us. Uh, for those of you who might be new, Karula is the dominant female leopard in this area, and she's very good at doing disappearing acts. Well, Howard has vacated. Oh, there's a nice little Mattel Franklin at the base of that Tamburiti tree. And we can hear that noise around us. Ah, there he is. Snuck in behind us. I just saw the hyena. Oh, 
Oh no, he just popped over it where we just come from. Ah, I was wondering when uh, these questions were going to come in. And uh, Raisa, who's one of our regular viewers in Finland of all places, uh, would like to know has Craig seen Kunyuma around Cheetah Plains? No. No. Fortunately not. From um, seems to be so I've just kind of taken over. <laughs> seems to have uh, moved a little bit further southwest from our traversing area. Um, so I'm not too sure when last he was seen. Probably a few weeks ago on a impala kill, if I'm not mistaken. So he is still around, but as with leopards, young males having to move out of their natal territories and trying to establish their own. Uh, they will move quite a far distance. Yeah, thanks for that, Craig. No problem. And uh, so also on that particular note uh, about young male dispersals, so in the Sabi Sands, the dispersals uh, seem to be a, a bit smaller than other areas. And Panthera, that organization that does a lot of uh, the leopard research in Africa and big cat research in general, uh, collared two dispersal males on Pinda Private Game Reserve, and one of them covered over a thousand kilometers um, from Pinda to the Southern Kruger National Park. Isn't that incredible? And the other did about 400 kilometers. So sometimes they just go a couple of territories over, but obviously if there's a lack of decent territory around, um, they can move vast distances. Howard vanished. Uh, for those of you who are not sure what Howard is, uh, Howard is my nickname for all hyenas, uh, named after my pet hyena. Don't worry, it's not a live one. Uh, it is a life-sized cardboard cutout of a female spotted hyena from the southern Sabi Sands um, that we used uh, while filming with Kevin Richardson doing uh, cognition studies between lions and the hyenas uh, to see who was the smartest. Uh, we all knew, but it was very interesting to actually do the research uh, with some of the top um, animal scientists in the world uh, from the University of Florida, University of Michigan, uh, University of Miami, University of um, Cambridge as well. And uh, we all sort of knew the outcome is that hyenas are much smarter than lions. Uh, to say lions is dumb is probably a little bit unfair, but uh, they're probably, if you want to say it nicely, they're very instinctive. But, for example, uh, we placed cardboard cutouts of potential prey species uh, in the exact same place three times a day, and we took the lions there. And those are two-dimensional frames, and the lions literally hunted the cardboard every single time. And we were very surprised when they hit it. I went, where'd it go? Where'd it go? And couldn't figure out that the kudu was now flat to the ground. They couldn't see it anymore. Uh, same was tried with hyenas, and they and ignored it completely, walked on, carried on. Uh, but the very interesting thing with the lions, what we learned, uh, which we suspected, but we didn't know for sure, uh, was to do with prey selection. Single lioness always went for the impala. Two lionesses uh, normally went for the kudu. Uh, and, uh, and we had a warthog, sorry, I mean, we had a warthog, uh, a kudu, uh, and uh, an impala, and a buffalo. And so all three of those small antelope with uh, just lionesses, uh, two or three lionesses, all generally from Kudu to Warthog to Impala. When we added an adult male, instinctively, now these lions uh, might have seen uh, the Warthog, Kudu and Impala um, as Kevin walks them out on the reserve there and there, those animals are around, uh, but they've never seen a buffalo any of those animals and as soon as we added a male they immediately ignored the small animals and went for the the possible big reward of a big kill in an, in an african buffalo so really fascinating stuff so harper who's popped us a little email oh the um, violet back starling. Don't fly, don't fly. Beautiful bird. Little bit to the right, there we go. 
So there we go, a violet backed starling. Harper, I'll get to your question in a second. Look at that color. Old name was a plum colored starling. No, you guys decide. What do you think's better? Plum colored or violet backed? Violet backed does sound slightly more exotic, I feel. So this is the male. I've been trying to see if I can spot a female. And in comparison, they are quite drab, sort of brown, nondescript starlings with little streaks on them, uh, which quite often happens in a lot of bird species, as the males need to be pretty to attract the ladies. Oh, look at that colour as he turns his head towards us. So, while we enjoy this view of the starling, it's like, what? oh, there we go, he's turning. So, it has that iridescence that a lot of the starling family does have, and iridescence is quite important for that drab female in terms of choosing a mate. So, when a male starling is losing condition or not that healthy, that wonderful iridescent glow and shine that you see on them uh, starts to fade uh, and the girls start ignoring him. So a nice healthy male has that lovely iridescent shine and will attract all the ladies. That's amazing, they don't normally sit for this long. All we need is the sun to break through the cloud to, to really bring out his iridescence. What's he up to? Is he looking for a meal or is he looking for a lady? So, as with, oh, off he goes. A lot of animals out here, uh, including human beings, uh, men will go to vast, vast lengths uh, to impress uh, a female. So, Harper was asking me about hyenas. I know Scott's on his way presently to the hyena den uh, and uh, Harper is wondering, do, do hyenas hunt a lot with their clan, or do they hunt singularly? Um, I know I've spotted Scott, he's on the damn wall, he's heading off to the hyena den. I'm still going to throw out my uh, lucky dice for a leopard uh, for the last bit of the safari. But we're going to cover Harper's question now. There's Scotty there on the damn wall. Say hello, Scotty and Tibbs. We seem to be bumping into each other quite a bit. Should we tickle Scotty's chin? There we go, tickle, 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 tickle. Yeah, he doesn't even know I tickled him. Uh, but Harper, what we often forget, and people like to block animals uh, into what the books say, and we must remember that a lot of an animal behavior is area specific as opposed to species specific. We chatted about it a bit this morning. So the elephants uh, in the, the Linianti, Savuti, uh, uh, Kondo area of northern Botswana actively hunt elephants regularly. It's very seldom you'll even hear. I've never actually heard of a, an active elephant hunt on a sort of 14 or 15 year old elephant uh, in, this, in this area. So hyenas, I know I've seen a clan of hyenas in northern Botswana. It was a particularly massive clan. Um, the scientists there from genetics had uh, actually confirmed at least 90 different individuals. There were probably closer to 130. <coughs> oh, excuse me. That clan hunted together, hunted adult hippo, hunted buffalo out of herds. Here we don't see that. Here they seem to scavenge a bit more, uh, but I'm sure they do do a lot of hunting we don't see. Specifically at this time of the year when there's a lot of babies, or probably a month ago, baby wildebeest, uh, baby impala, uh, they will definitely do their own hunting. Also, when there's not a lot of lions and leopards and that to scavenge off, hyenas are forced to hunt, and often in a lot of areas, they're far more successful hunters than the cats. Uh, on average, in, in the greater Kruger, lion sits on about um, 11 to 12% success rate uh, on hunts. So only 1.2 times out of 10 that it chases something, it actually catches it. Leopards slightly more successful on around 14%. Uh, and hyenas in areas where they hunt regularly are often over 20%. And of course, none of them compare to my favorite animal and the all-time greatest animal in the world, the African wild dog, which sits at about 80%. But anyway, uh, let's jump across to Scotty, who's got a large bovid to show you from the dam wall.
Well, I'm certainly glad I'm not involved in this tangle of horns. Although, they don't seem to be taking it too seriously. This little wrestling match. And I'm not too sure what these two big old boys are fighting about because there's no ladies around. And maybe it's more of a friendship wrestle than anything too serious. And judging by the one on the left, almost using the other one as a pillow for now, I don't think we're going to see things escalate. We need to race here across to Brent. None of shit you. So we just had a, a quick view. What looks to be a juvenile African hawk eagle. We can't really see clearly now. But very interesting. Just from the size and general shape. Uh, I think, what do you think if I go forward there? And we actually need to see his frontal side. It made it look a little bit red to me. Uh, here's my bird Bible. And we did find their nest uh, early on this year, so I wonder if this is a progeny of the pair we see regularly here on Juma. So we can see it's a true eagle, or an Aquila eagle, by the fact that the hair runs all the way down the leg and doesn't stop like a snake eagle. Yeah, definitely a juvenile African hawk eagle. Um, you can see that sort of uh, almost creamish red leg sticking out to the side, uh, and that's one of the giveaways. And when he flew, we could see the barring, a uh, very lightly barred um, underwing, and obviously as it gets older, a lot of those barrings and that will be far more visible. I'm just going to try and maybe go forward a scope to see if we can see a, a little bit better. So Tim B says he loves seeing the birds. At first it was all about the big animals. Kim, sorry, not Tim B. There we go, look at that ruffle. And there you can see a bit more of that sort of creamy red color I was referring to. So the reason we saw a pale morph tawny, uh, the reason this isn't a tawny um, that we saw this morning is that the size, it's a little bit smaller than a tawny eagle and also very two-dimensional colored, which is not as apparent in your brown eagle species. So a juvenile African hawk eagle. And he's out on the prowl. Squirrels, Franklin, guinea fowl, beware. You can see the barring actually really nicely now, and it will come far more apparent in his adult age along his tail. And look at those talons. I mean, if he had to get a grip into you, that would be a very painful experience. Oh, beautiful. There he goes. So, for those of you who are new and might not wonder what the adult looks like, here we go. There we go, number two, the African hawk eagle. Definitely one of my favorite predatory birds we get here at Juma. And you can see that sort of rufous pale color that we were getting there. Uh, and there's the adult. Becomes an incredibly beautiful black and white bird. And the nest that the adults had is probably only about a kilometer from here. So maybe it's the baby from last year, all grown up and out to see the world for himself. So we're going to continue uh, now on towards the northern boundary and uh, see if we can find any tracks coming through. So while we do that, uh, let's go back to Scotty D, see what he's up to. Well, isn't the African hawk eagle a wonderful, wonderful bird of prey? And it sounds like he had some great views. And we spent a couple more minutes with those buffalo bulls just to make sure that there wasn't going to be a serious argument between the two of them, and it didn't look like it. So we have ventured forth with our initial plan, which was to head to the hyena den. And haven't been here for quite a while, so really looking forward to seeing what's going on. And let's just hope that it's active. There's a chance that we could see five different small little cubs running around, three different mothers, and a whole bunch of 
kind of adolescents and sub-adults in between. So, good prospects. Let's just hope we're in luck this afternoon. Buffalo. Oh, you look like you're quite worked up. We're going to carry on before you decide to come crashing into us. Austin, age just 13, would like to know if lions or leopards will kill hyena for food. And usually not for food, Austin. If anything, they'll kill them simply to eliminate competition. But occasionally, they will feed on hyena once they have killed them. It's mainly lion, though, that will kill hyena. Very difficult job for a leopard to kill a hyena. They're very equally matched, one-on-one. -on -one. And more often than not, there's more hyena than just one. So they can team up on leopard. However, if a leopard was to come across a, a young hyena or a hyena cub, obviously that would be an easy, easy opponent to kill. But it's no guarantee that they will feed on them. And interestingly, Austin has, has quite often written down in textbooks that predators will not feed on other predators once they've killed them, but that's definitely not the case. There's just no set rule as to whether they will or whether they won't. But lion and leopard very seldomly kill hyena in this area, so not something that I expect to see. Hello, James Richards, and Yes, it would be very interesting to check whether the pygmy kingfishers are still living at the old hyena den. There's a strong chance that they could be. Popped in there very briefly the other day when we were looking for Karula after losing in some thick bush. Just up ahead of us actually, she was moving through this area. And the old hyena den is very close by to this one, just off to our right. But didn't see the pygmy kingfishers then, but it would be interesting to go back and do a little bit of a stake out there. Oh, this isn't what I was expecting. Not looking good at all. Absolutely nobody home. And usually in these small little burrows there, and on the other side of the termite mound over there, will be where you see the adults lying and the cubs playing around, all around this big old termitarium. So what used to be a home for termites has now become a home for hyena. How fascinating. But at the moment, nobody's home. Bev, in Durban, my hometown, would like to know if They've possibly moved their den site, and Bev, I don't think so. I think that it's just that the adults have moved off early today in search of a meal, or possibly have been away the whole day, and will only return later tonight. I know you did get a glimpse of one with friends. I'm not sure which direction it was heading in, but I don't think they would have moved just yet. It's not to say that they haven't, but it still looks like the pathways in and around that den are very well used. That area is still inhabited, so it's merely our timing that I think is off Bev. Maybe what we'll do is we'll go around and check the other den just to make sure. Who knows? We often get surprised out here. And that way we can also take a look to see if James Richards Kingfishers are still in town. So we'll head up and Zubu Road onto our northern boundary and then back down Gallego Shortcut, which is the road that runs parallel to this little riverbed where the hyena have got multiple little den sites dotted around, or well, not multiple, just two in this area that we know of. Huh. 
Lake in Florida. You'd like to check in on the grey hooded kingfishers and the area where Brent thinks they could be nesting. I actually chatted to him about it today, Mike, and he doesn't think that they're nesting there anymore. He did in fact see one this morning, but it wasn't a good visual, so don't worry. <laughs> But he did see on on, we, uh, on Twin Dams Road, close to Spaghetti Junction, and I think he is in that general area now, so I'm sure Kirsty will tell him to keep an eye out for the grey hooded. I haven't seen nearly as many around as earlier on in the summer, so maybe they have moved elsewhere, you know, because we're experiencing abnormal weather conditions in this area. We may find that a lot of the migratory animals, or even the regular animals that don't migrate here, have moved off to greener pastures elsewhere. Brent seems to think strongly that that is the case, that a lot of the birds, especially the birds who can fly quite easily from place to place, have gone off in areas where there's more rainfall and where there's been more rainfall, there'll be more insects, more food, easier living so that could be a reason why less grey hooded kingfishers are around well Brent hasn't found a grey hooded kingfisher but he has found you a beautiful sunset spot so that is where you are off to As you can see, the sun is setting to the west. Beautiful. See, there is some cloud build up there, but again, I think it's too high to produce any rain. And we're sitting on the northern edge of our traverse on the Buffalo Hook cut line. It's almost like a road to nowhere. Or is it a road to perdition or a road to redemption? Mm, I wonder. So, it's at times like this, at this sort of time of the day, that one of my favorite authors and had some wonderful quotes comes to mind. Oh, look, there's Scott stealing my route. Naughty, naughty. Um, I think we also, he's also got the idea there might be quite a lot of elephants coming through on that northwestern corner. But, to quote Ernest Hemingway, I never had a bad day while I was in Africa. So Hemingway was a great lover of Africa. I spent a lot of time in, in, in what is in Kenya and Tanzania. And a man who was a master with the word. Oh. Scott has now left us limited choices to where we're gonna go, so we'll see where he goes and then decide next. So possibly that hyena we had a very brief visual of. Uh, I said I thought it was leaving the den, so obviously headed out in the evening to forage. So we've got another question for Craggy Boy. Uh, and of course, our viewers, a lot of our viewers like to follow um, the Cheetah Plains updates. Uh, and Safari Dean would like to know uh, from Craig, which animals uh, do you see uh, on Cheetah Plains that we don't see as often on Safari Live's Travis area? So take it away, Craigie boy. Well, that's... A little bit of a, an interesting question. Um, there's been some fantastic sightings of a sable bull that has come in from the Kruger Park. Again, you've heard Brent talk about the, uh, the drought and how animals are moving vast distances in order to uh, come look for water. And um, so, yeah, there's a sable bull that we've seen quite often. Um, there's, I'm just trying to think, again, mainly the animals we see here. Cheetah, I think, as Brent has mentioned. How could I forget those beautiful cats? Uh, we do have a coalition of two male cheetah that we've seen once or twice here um, in, in the Juma area. Uh, they tend to, to move through the Kruger boundary, um, cheetah plains and Marla Marla, to their general route. Um, and yeah, it's, it's pretty much the same, the same animals out on our side. Uh, it all depends on what's happening. It's one of the joys about being out here. You never know what's gonna happen. Thanks, Craig. 
Yes, now, occasionally I get very, very jealous when I hear about the cheetah at Cheetah Plains. And I'm quite surprised you forgot, since it's called, your, your lodge is called Cheetah Plains. I have just come back from leave, so... Ah, exactly. We'll, we'll, we'll blame it on that one. Just back from leave. <laughs> I'm just going to get hold of Scott and see what his plan is so I can make mine. Scott, Scott, Dyson, do you copy? Yep. <laughs> Scotty, what's your route from Bubbles of Katla? I'm going to go to all day and then I'm switching to the Ah, copy. Uh, I'm going to keep heading uh, west or northwest on uh, the cut line. Aha. Uh -huh. I know there's been some requests for grey hooded kingfisher. We had a brief uh, sighting of one on the sunrise safari, but Scott's on his way to find you the most beautiful and the smallest kingfisher. Or, actually, I'm not sure. I think it is the smallest. It could be the second smallest, or it's a very close tie between two kingfisher species. Uh, but this one is the insectivore of the two, not the pescivore. See if you guys can work out what Scotty's looking for. Country West has uh, asked me a slightly controversial question. Um, she says she's seen um, pictures and, and videos of uh, safari vehicles in the Masai Mara in Kenya allowing cheetah to climb onto their vehicles. And what is my thought on that? Uh, personally, I wouldn't let the cheetah do it. It's very simple to stop them. As soon as they start, you just on the side of your car and that will stop them jumping. It is a really incredible experience for the guests uh, but one must remember that it is a big cat uh, and for me personally and, and I know there's a lot of people out there who might disagree with me I think it's almost just a little bit of res loss of respect for the animal uh, and it is a big cat it does have big teeth big claws and it's not if it's when something in those situations can go wrong and so for me personally I would I would choose not to let the cheetah do that uh, there's never been a recorded case of a wild cheetah actively attacking or hunting a person but if there is going to be one the first one will be with those cheetah that climb onto vehicles in the Masai Mara uh, there has been quite a lot of captive cheetah that have more people but that's a slight a completely different situation and uh, I actually am very very fond of cheetah on the reserve where my parents are I've spent about four years habituating two male cheetah that I can actually now follow them on foot while they hunt and I've actually seen them while walking take down baby wildebeest and impala so incredible um, when they're not hunting obviously when they're hunting i keep my distances not to interfere the same as what we would if we were in the game drive vehicle except you've got to be a lot more careful on foot because obviously you're adding another predator into the mix and the animals will react to that bipedal figure of man and i was hoping there might be some ellies around here but it doesn't look like it and we are going to continue on a little bit further so while well, vm shows you the drakensberg mountains in the distance for the last view before you pop off. Oh, where'd the mountains go? There they are, uh, to Scott, uh, who's looking for that beautiful little kingfisher for you guys. So, Bev and Durban, here we are at the other hyena den that was most recently used by the same clan of hyena that we were hoping to bump in at the other den site and doesn't look highly utilized and james richards also no sign of these pygmy kingfishers obviously it's a lot easier to sit here waiting for the kingfishers to pop up when there are some hyena to entertain us in between but to sit here now with nothing else other than the faint hope of a kingfisher arriving i think would be a brave move. So I think we'll continue. We have been here a couple of minutes. I haven't heard any of the calls of the pygmy kingfisher. Very distinctive, high-pitched kind of tweetering. 
almost like kind of a technological sound. And let me just play it quickly. That's one way of giving an idea of exactly what they sound like. Give me a second. There's a Cape Turtle Dove calling in the distance. Well, race has just reminded me of a terrible smell that was coming from these hyena dens that Jamie was talking of. And I think there, there's, there's two different smells. I mean, I'm not sure exactly which one she was talking about, Raisa. There's the smell that hyenas leave behind that you can smell for probably a couple of weeks um, once they've left, and that's just their kind of remnant smells. But there was also the smell of what Jamie thought was death. Something had died in one of these burrows, according to Jamie. Now, I can't smell death nor hyena um, at the moment, but like I said, about a couple of weeks would usually be the average time that you can still smell if hyenas have been around. Let me play the call of this pygmy kingfisher now. high-pitched kind of almost like a frequency very distinctive and I'm sure you've got a good enough idea of what to listen for now in the future good and while we're on the kingfishers we may as well show you some of the pictures of what this pygmy kingfisher looks like it's an incredibly pretty little bird tiny I mean Literally, life-size, it would probably be the same size as what you're looking at on the screen. And there we go. I prefer the photographs. They give you a much better idea of how pretty they are. Often they've got very blunt beaks from digging into these little cavities in the ground that they live in. And they can live in termitariums and all banks of riverbeds. And the difference, the main distinguishing feature between an African pygmy kingfisher and the malachite kingfisher, which is its cousin that relies on water, this one doesn't rely on water, is that the malachite kingfisher's blue on the crown of its head will come over its eye, whereas the pygmy kingfisher's clearly doesn't touch the eye. That's one good distinguishing feature between the two. Good. Quite nice to be just stopped stationary for a while and with the ability to listen because if any animals are uncomfortable with the presence of a leopard or any other predators in the area, they'd be sure to be making a racket and we would therefore be able to respond to wherever that racket was being made from. I remember quite often with guests when you'd be stopped at this stage of the evening for your sundowners and you would have to race to pack up all the drinks and snacks to be able to respond to alarm calls. Hello to Lynn in Michigan who's interested in some other noises that she hasn't heard that much of recently, and that is the African scop song. Was the sound that Lynn was hearing on the Juma waterhole camera, or a similar sound, I guess, not exactly like that. And Lynn would like to know why are we not hearing them that much anymore? Well, obviously they've done all of their courting, all of their territorial warfares for this kind of summer breeding season. And that's what I would put it down to, that they've already peaked. Their social time of the year has peaked and finished now. Well, not completely finished, because I did hear one the other night. But it's not nearly as common as a few months ago. And it will change with all the birds. They'll all have their little moment to sing along to us. And the different species will vary slightly during the summer months as to when they call. And 
something interesting and another key kind of distinguishing feature to help you work out if you are hearing a stop sound calling is that it's about a exactly about a four second delay between each one two three four so quite a nice one that you can predict exactly when their next call is going to be obviously up to a point because you never know when exactly they may stop so you can come unstuck but usually once they're in the swing of things every four seconds they will let out that shrill call just want to head across to the little Gallagher waterhole which is not too far from here and just make sure that none of the hyena are over there hello buffalo Lots of buffalo bulls around at the moment on the go slow. Jen in Minnesota would like to know if there are any small cats that survive out here in Africa. And yes, there's many different small cat-like animals. Um, serval, caracal, the African wild cat, are three that you get in this area, um, that are all very, very small, ranging from probably about 10 pounds to about 30 pounds in weight. So all about knee high or smaller. Sadly, we don't see the caracal or the serval very often. I know Brent's seen a couple of serval here, but not many. I think maybe the only one um, in the year that we've been here. African wildcats, I am not sure how many are in the Sabi Sands, but I don't know any other guides that have seen them here. But there are rumors to be here. Further north would be in the Timbavati, not far away actually. There's quite a few African wildcats, which basically looks like a domestic cat, very similar in size, but it's just got kind of more wild markings, I guess. Jen, um, we do get them here, but not as many as we would like. And it is really interesting how you can go to different safari destinations where you will be able to see a lot more often than not those smaller but still very, very cool little cat like animals. Oh, let's hope we can get you a visual of this pair of tabs. Keep an eye on that one with a long tail there. Oh, no. That was a paradise flycatcher. Very, very nice bird to see. Orange with a long, long streamer that trails after it. And once we get to the waterhole, I'll get a picture of it for you. I haven't managed to show you one this summer yet, the paradise flycatcher. Last summer, some of you remember there was one that was nesting at the bubbles of waterhole. Um, we never managed to get it on the nest for you, I don't think perched on their tiny little cup nest. Okay, so we have got a few visitors at the waterhole. But it's not the hyena that I was thinking maybe here. It's a pair of kudu. You would have noticed some lights to the left where before Teb zoomed in on them and those are the lights and a little viewing deck from Galago Camp, which is one of the two camps here on Juma. And they're both wonderful camps that you have to hire out as an entirety. So you book the whole place out with you and your friends. It can sleep 10 people. Obviously, you can come with less if you would like, but you pay for the camp as a whole and therefore have free reign over the place as if it's your own home. And I really love that kind of a camp environment where you're not mixed among strangers. And also it means that you're also on the vehicles with your friends and not with strangers. So quite a nice way to go about things if you can muster up a group of 10 people. Look at how cautious she is. She wants to drink, but she's associating this water hole with danger. Now she's could possibly be scared of a crocodile lurching out at her. 
even though it's a tiny waterhole, crocodile are very, very stealthy and very, very cunning. So that's maybe why she's a little bit scared, but she's also kind of twisting her ears backwards, making sure that she can hear anything that may be approaching her from behind. So she's not only worried about what could come out of the water, she could come worry about what could come from behind. Not taking any chances. Who knows, on top of just her visual and audio senses, her nose may be telling her a story, and maybe there's the sense of a leopard in and around where she is from earlier on last night or early this morning but finally she's mustered up the courage to quench her thirst she's got very interesting vertical white stripes on her body and quite a big gap between that prominent big white one towards her hindquarters and then the next few, those two that touch one another are also quite strange, and I'm on a midriff. Very useful for helping the kudu camouflage in their leafy, well-wooded habitat, being browsers. Oh, what a wonderful, serene and peaceful evening it is here in the Sabi Sands. It's been a most pleasant and relaxing drive. And after yesterday's action, quite nice just to be on a bit of a go slow. Well, very happy that we got to see her quenching her thirst and not get attacked by anything halfway through, although half of me wouldn't have mind that, minded if that happened, because we do see attacks between predator and prey very seldomly. Anyway, we are going to send you across to some more animals that Brent has found you. I just noticed some elephants crossing uh, the Triple M, uh, which uh, makes up the, oh, maybe the western boundary of uh, Juma. Uh, further down, it's Juma and Arethusa both sides. But those ellies are heading down those magnificently large elephant paths that I've been harping on about for the last couple of days. So we're just going to loop around, try and get in front of them, and hopefully they're just going to surround us. So now I know quite a few of you, um, some of our South African viewers and some of our international viewers as well, come across and often go to the Kruger. So I've been doing some how to approach elephant lessons. So I'll keep that up and there might be a test tomorrow or the next day. So we better be paying attention uh, to what we're looking for when we approach an elephant, how to know whether it's safe uh, and what to do if the situation does become a bit tricky. I noticed them coming through here, and you can see these alley paths stretching through the bush from water to food. And I think they should be popping out at the next ones. An alley through there. I think it might be. This is one of the big highways here, and I think these eddies are mobile down. Remember, first rule, approaching elephants. Oh, <laughs> low range. And the reason we do low range is to keep the revs nice and even, and uh, all sort of loud noises. You imagine the revving of an engine might come across as a very aggressive sound towards an elephant. So we put into low range, and we move very slowly, very calmly, and quite often I'll talk constantly, uh, sort of a very nice, even tone, sort of reassuring reassure, tone. I'll only raise my voice if they start misbehaving. There we go. And as we approach, we're looking for those telltale signs of that tail becoming slightly erect, raising the ears, uh, or sort of moving away from us in a very fast manner. 
And you can see this is a young bull. He's just ambling. Uh, so, poof. And it looks like he's uh, just passed gas as well as we went past. Uh, a nice smelly Ellie. There he goes on that big path. And you can see he's just slowly feeding uh, as he moves his way towards uh, the water. Mary in Michigan has raised a very valid point. She'd like to know, uh, can the drought have an, a negative effect on an animal like an elephant's teeth because of the drought? Most definitely, they'll be forced to feed off the far, far harder foliage, uh, and they'll be forced to eat a lot more to get the same amount of starch or sugars that they would get from grass. I forgot, I didn't quite end up finishing that discussion we were having about um, the difference between browsing and grazing. Quite often with the browsing, there's a lot, I mean the grazing, the grass holds a lot more sugar, a lot more nutrients for a lot less effort. And that's why the elephants choose to feed off it during the summer months. And uh, when there's not so much grass around in the winter months, they feed off the trees. You can see he's already had a splish splash. And you can see there's a couple of wet spots behind his ear from uh, wherever he found some water. Uh, but yes, Mary, most definitely, uh, well, there will be a, a, a slight effect that the teeth will wear a little bit quicker and as we was, uh, we've often mentioned that animal behavior and, and, and a lot of animal facts can differ from the same species in different areas. So in areas uh, where, like the rainforest where there is very little grass, uh, the elephant's teeth do wear down quite a bit sooner and they have a slightly less or a slightly shorter lifespan uh, than an elephant that lives in the Masai Mara. So the rest of the herd should be speaking up behind us. So even you could say in the, the greater Kruger area, which is a mostly a broadleafed woodland, uh, although there are some nice big grassy areas uh, towards the east on the basalt plains, um, you would probably say it's possible, I'd actually have to have a, a closer look at a bit more of that information, it's possible the Ellie's here, I live slightly shorter lives uh, than their cousins who live on those massive open grasslands in the Masai Mara and the Serengeti. So they're not really, I was hoping when they crossed the path it looked like they were on a mission. Uh, it looks more to be that they've now had a drink, there's some water uh, across at Sibambili and they're now spread out through the bush and are slowly feeding. But, the one thing I'm quite happy about the drought is that we are having these incredible elephant sightings and huge numbers of them at the moment. So I wonder, there's a little one there, if there's any water left in what one of our viewers termed the hyena beach. noted how amazing and how well worn these elephant paths were uh, these elephant paths are and so they are and they, they've been using them for many many years and I just want to have a look so one of our viewers termed it hyena beach we often found the hyenas in this little cove here and sort of hidden a pan that dried up a little bit slower than the others because it was in the shade Apart from that, I've actually even seen the shadow here, and we've seen the elephants utilize this, and their, one of their main highways goes right up to that, and it does look like it's still holding water. Isn't that incredible? This is probably the last pan on Juma that's holding water from the rain, and there's a little Ellie there taking advantage of that and having a drink. So the reason this little pan is still holding water where the rest of them aren't, it avoids direct sunlight for a lot of the day. And you can see the elephants know this, and there's that very prominent trail that leads right up to it. That's being very wasteful now, madam. Don't you know it's a drought? You can't just be spraying water about. So it might seem a little bit unusual to you. There's a little sub-adult here and oh, blowing bubbles. And you can't see very many adults. But in this area, as I was saying, the lions don't really hunt elephants. 
where there's a young elephant like this in a place like Savuti would not leave its mother's side because it is an easy size for a lion to catch or that particular pride. Here, they're not too worried about that. And the herd is spread out over quite a vast area around us. Uh, sometimes they can even be a kilometer apart. So you have a look, that tail's become slightly erect. It might feel a little bit nervous that mom's not too close, but still not storming off. So remember those little telltale signs. And sometimes the head shaking and whatnot can be a little bit harder to, to read, but an erect tail is a very good sign of an animal that's not completely relaxed. So I'm gonna leave her and move out, uh, give her a little bit of space. Um, it's not, as with all things, it's not a steadfast, hard and true rule. Um, and just, just watching the way she moves, I think she might just be um, about to have a bowel movement. Uh, but if you're not sure and you haven't, and there's mom just behind there, um, and if you haven't spent as much, a, a, a lot of time with elephants in vehicles or on foot, rather please be safe. Uh, don't take a chance. <laughs> Bless you, Brad. Thank you. Oh, well, there's some lots of zebra, as I've been saying. Incredible amounts of zebra around at the moment. It's about the sixth herd I've seen. So, uh, Craig, Diane would like to know, what do you think of this live safari malarkey? Uh, do you ever watch them when you're at home? <laughs> Very good question. Um, I'm going to be honest, I do have withdrawal symptoms when I'm on leave. So it's always nice to, to log on and uh, sort of see what's going on in the areas where, where I can drive as well. Um, so yes, I, I am guilty of logging on every now and again, just to get my safari fix, if you will. Ah, <laughs> oh, there we go. Isn't that wonderful? I didn't know. Who would have thought our colleagues out here in the Sabi Sands occasionally sneak a peek, a, a, a quick peek at what we're up to uh, while they're on leave. But uh, we're closing, coming towards the end of the safari. And... Uh, it's been wonderful having you on the back and great to have Craig with us today uh, to come have a look how the live safaris operate. Often we'll share a sighting, but it's been lovely having you on the back for the full full drive. We've got to chat and it's always wonderful to have other guides around. We can chat and share information and knowledge. And that's at the end of the day what this is about, sharing our passion and our love for the African bush with as many people as possible and hopefully creating future conservationists. And uh, now before we cross to Scott, I'm gonna give you one really sort of ethereal view of a nearly full moon and then we're going to jump across to Scott so you can say goodbye but don't well I just thought we'd show you a glimpse of what looks to be a full moon but it's rising up at quite a rate and about to be obscured by the branch of a massive marula tree. I remember Mvula, the big male leopard, having a young impala hoisted right over there this time last year. And at the base of this tree this time last year, it was filled with red flowers. And she got a wonderful photo of him poking his head out of those red flowers. So happy memories with this tree. And hopefully we will be able to create more happy memories with you in the future. Sadly, it's time to say goodbye. Thanks, Tebs, Nikki, and Kirsten, the final control room. We will see you all tomorrow for the Sunrise Safari.
Thank you.